Sí, saludos. Eh, muy buenas tardes y eh, espero que hayan, Anja, estén hasta el momento, todas las charlas a las que, ha a las que ha participado, les hayan aprendido algo eh, porque, y que estén listos para eh, nuestro keynote de cierre, eh, donde tendremos a Luciano, eh, muy conocido en la comunidad de Python, tanto de Latinoamérica como en la comunidad eh, eh, anglohispana, anglo, anglo-parlante, eh, por sus aportes en todo lo que tiene que ver el ecosistema de Python. Y eh, Fluent Python, si, 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 si has estu estudiado Python de algún libro, muy probable que te hayas topado por, con este libro en algún momento de, de, de tu carrera. Eh, Luciano, welcome. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. And as, as thank you very much for being here with us. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Luciano, uh, um, esta es una nota para los, los, los que van a estar escuchando esta presentación. Eh, la presentación va a ser en inglés. Eh, Luciano, se le pueden acercar y hablar el español. Yo entiendo que él tiene un español eh, bien bueno, pero la presentación de, de ahora será en inglés y... Eh, como dijimos en, un, en otro keynote, tratar, eh, eh, los, cuando se suban los videos trataremos de que tengan traducciones para esas personas que, que tienen problemas entendiendo un idioma diferente español. Luciano, the, again, thank you very much. The stage is all, is all yours. Thank you. Antes de empezar, uh, os invito a asistir a la conferencia Python Brasil que ese, ese año será en línea y se impartirá entre el 11 y el 17 de octubre en nuestro canal de YouTube y en uh, Discord. Por primera vez tendremos un track totalmente en español. Entonces, síganos en, la, en nuestras uh, redes sociales, arroba Python Brasil, para tener más información. Perdón por no presentar mi charla en español, pero mi español no es tan bueno como el de Débora Cefeto y no es suficientemente bueno para una charla técnica. Lo siento mucho. Uh, ok. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really honored to be speaking at uh, PyCon Latam with all these other amazing speakers and keynotes. And... Uh, So let's let's get started. <clears throat> so my talk is type hints, protocols, and good sense. And uh, uh, I, I I I thought about doing this talk when I read this this tweet by Raymond Hettinger, who is a very famous core committer and also instructor and also author of very important parts of the Python documentation and standard library. Uh, So Raymond said that he, he wished there was more balanced reporting on user experiences with typing. And I, as I worked in, in my book, the, the second edition of Fluent Python, I watched uh, nine different talks about typing. I, I, I read a lot, studied a lot of articles, read discussions, peps, and so on, but I also watched nine different talks. And, and he's right. The only talk that I watched that was not by somebody who was promoting type hints like it was their job to promote type hints was by Guido. Guido has a great talk about that. And he is uh, the only one that I watched that actually talked about some downsides and, you know. And I think it's important for anyone and anyone embracing new features of the language or any new technology to know that as <laughs> as we all know nothing is perfect right so uh, it's important that you know there are qualities there are advantages but also that you are aware of of problems right so that's my goal here to try and present a, 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 what in my opinion is a balanced view about uh, type hints <clears throat> so this was the first edition of my book. I'm really proud because it has been published in uh, nine languages. I hope there is a, a, a Spanish edition for the <clears throat> second edition. 
maybe we can, you know, if anybody is interested in helping me uh, publish a Spanish edition, please contact me. Uh, but it has been published in nine languages, and now I'm, I'm, I'm finishing the review of this of the second edition which is about it covers python 3.9 and 3.10 including my uh, pattern matching it has more than 100 new pages about type hints and there are many examples not only in the chapters about type hints but elsewhere in the book many of the examples in other parts of the book already have type hints as well it, it has updated coverage of async await when with examples with async io fast api and curio and uh, there's, the draft is available now at O'Reilly.com. So O'Reilly.com now is a subscription service, sort of like uh, Netflix, where you pay a yearly fee to get access to lots of books. But there, here's a tip, because the, the, it's pretty expensive, the service. However, the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM.org, uh, is a professional uh, organization, the, the organization that awards the Turing Award. So it's a very important uh, organization in the in computer science, publishes many important journals. They have a, a membership for people in developing countries that depending on the country, I think the last time I checked for Brazil, it was $40 a year. And so that's less than 10 percent of the cost of the o'reilly subscription but as a member of the acm acm.org uh, you get an email at acm.org you get access to their incredible uh, resources in terms of journals and so on and you also get access to o'reilly books in a, in, in in the uh, online uh, so including my book so he, that's the tip if you become a member of the ACM, acm.org, you can have access to my book and thousands of other books in the O'Reilly service uh, at a fraction of the cost. Because, uh, you know, for those of you who live in, in a developing country, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, this talk is about stuff that I learned while I contributed to the official type, type shed project. I'm going to talk about it. And also, I, I, I helped reorganize the typing module documentation. So we are, the talk is, is split in three parts. I'm going to first talk about the four modes of, of typing in Python. Then I'm going to talk about what I consider the central rule of typing protocol. Uh, which is sort of a new feature of typing, and then talk about the limits of typing and how to address them, okay? So the four modes of typing. Uh, probably everybody knows uh, about the distinction, every programmer knows about the distinction between static typing and dynamic typing. So for instance, well, Java is a language that uses static typing, and Python traditionally used only dynamic typing. And the thing about static and dynamic typing, the most important thing is when the checking happens. So static typing is designed for static checking, which means uh, for tools like a compiler or a linter or an IDE that looks at your code without running it. So that's why it's called static. So it looks at your code and checks whether uh, the operations that you do with the objects and the variables and the parameters you pass to functions and so on are consistent with the types that you declare explicitly in the code, right? So that's what static typing is about. It's something that happens before your program runs, before it's compiled, as you know, Python is compiled, right? Python code is compiled to bytecode. When you do, when you open a console and say, and write print, open parentheses, uh, hello world, close parentheses, uh, that code, when you hit enter, is compiled to bytecode. 
and then <clears throat> the bytecode is executed and you see the results. Anyway, Python does not do static checking in the compilation step, but Java obviously does. Uh, and then there's uh, dynamic typing, which means that the checking, it doesn't mean that there's no type checking. There is type checking, but the type checking happens at runtime. And when you, when, when, when something goes wrong at runtime in terms of types, what you get is a type error exception, right? It's a very common exception that everybody who works with Python has seen lots of times. So type error is an example of a, of a, an operation that fails a type check at runtime. Okay, now this is not a binary thing, it's really a continuum, okay? Um, because <clears throat> there are some kinds of checks that may be done uh, depending on the language and depending on the tools that you're using, there, there may be a continuum of checks that happen at, uh, before the program runs, when it's running, maybe when it's loaded, when you import a module. Anyway, there's, there's a continuum of places or moments when uh, type errors can be found. Now, there's also the concept of duck typing, which according to the Wikipedia, uh, Alex Martelli, who is a very famous Pythonista, the author of uh, the Python in a nutshell and prior editions of Python cookbook and a very important contributor. Uh, also, Alex Martelli has answered thousands of <laughs> of messages in at Stack Overflow about Python. He is one of the top responders about Python on Stack Overflow. Anyway, he, uh, according to the Wikipedia, he's the guy who popularized this uh, idea of duck typing. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, because his message that I quote here was one of the earliest, is one of the earliest examples found in by the Wikipedia editors uh, of, of somebody using the, 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 talking about duck typing or using the duck metaphor in the context of, of programming languages, right? So the idea is that you don't check whether it is a duck, but you check whether it quacks like a duck or walks like a duck depending on what subset of duck-like behavior you need. So duck typing is about checks of behavior instead of checks of types. Now, it's interesting because uh, the, the scenario is not just a one-dimensional line like I showed before, but it's more like this. And so you have Besides left and right static and runtime checking, you have top and bottom, which, which is like structural types at the top and nominal types at the bottom. So nominal types mean means that the types have a specific name that is explicitly declared, right? And a structural type means that uh, the checking is not done by explicit names of types, but by looking at the structure of the objects, uh, specifically the methods that the object implements. So duck typing is in, in the top uh, right quadrant where uh, it's the types are checked at runtime and the checking is structural. Uh, the program is interested in knowing whether the, 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 the object implements a method, right? And uh, on the bottom left, we have static typing, which is static checking with nominal types. And again, you know, that's the, the top left, the top right is Python style and the, and the bottom left is the Java style, right? Now, there is also something that another term that Alex Martelli uh, uh, invented and that I, I cover in my book, uh, goose typing, which is runtime checking 
using nominal types. When, uh, <clears throat> when you check whether something is an instance of an abstract class, right? Uh, this is the, the, the typical example. Uh, when, if, you know, I, 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 have, I can have a check life. If uh, the value is a sequence, then I'm going to do this. And sequence is an ABC, is an abstract type uh, from the collections.abc module, right? So whose typing is, is, uh, is something that's traditionally done in Python as well, uh, <clears throat> at least since Python 2.6 and Python 3.0, which was when ABCs were introduced in the language. Uh, and now, uh, since Python 3.8, we have static duck typing, right? This is a term that appears in the PEP, PEP 544, the PEP that introduced the idea of protocols or structural subtyping. So this completes the, the, the map here. So what I'm saying here is that actually Python now with type hints, uh, supports all four modes of, of type checking. Okay. <clears throat> Just as an, an example, some languages, uh, like TypeScript is another language that supports all four modes. Java only supports the static typing mode, right? Go is a modern language that supports uh, static typing, but also static duck typing. This is something that <clears throat> uh, something that I really liked when I learned Go, the fact that it, it, it implements this idea of static duck typing. And uh, it also, Go also has uh, runtime mechanisms for checking types <clears throat> uh, that are unknown at compile time in the form of uh, type assertions which is a, a form of, of goose typing that uh, Go has, okay? <clears throat> now, the important thing, I, I don't have time to explain, you know, I hope uh, uh, I, I, if you are interested in this subject, I hope either you have already studied type hints elsewhere or that you will study after I talk. I want to encourage you to study type hints but I don't have time to explain it. Uh, so this talk is more about the philosophy and the thinking around type hints, okay? And this is a very important point for those that, that are new to the idea of type hints in Python. The fact that uh, the authors of, of PEP 484, the PEP that introduced type hints, the semantics of type hints, the static type system of type hints, they, they wrote that Python will remain a dynamically typed language and the authors have no desire to ever make type hints mandatory, even by convention, okay? So this is super important to be, everybody should be aware that Python is not becoming a statically typed language where, where every code should have type hints, okay? Now, what Python has is called gradual typing because type hints are all, always optional. So you can put no type hints or you can put type hints in some parts of the program, or you can put type hints everywhere, which at the end I will say why I don't recommend doing that. But you can have, you know, maybe 90% of your program has type hints and some parts don't. Uh, maybe if it's a simple program, you can do 100%, but I don't want to, actually talk too much about percentages. But anyway, there are other languages like TypeScript, Dart, and Hack that uh, ha are gradually typed. And so, like I said, type hints are always optional, right? Uh, and even if you're using a type checker or an IDE that, that does type checking, you can inhibit the warnings uh, by module or by line or by function, 
right? Uh, so the, the the idea of a gradual type type system is that it's always optional. When you don't declare a type, the default is any, which is a type that is compatible with everything. Uh, this type also exists, for instance, in TypeScript, and, and it's called dynamic in TypeScript. Right? C Sharp also has a dynamic type, right? So there is kind of this trend now where even traditionally statically typed languages like C Sharp have introduced a way to uh, to say that at, at compile time, we don't know the type of this thing or we accept anything. And then at runtime, we, we, we handle it. Go also has the concept of an empty interface that does that, okay? Now, this is very important. The third point here, it does not catch errors at runtime, right? The fact that you annotate a function to say this function receives an integer doesn't mean that it will cause a runtime error if you pass a string. Is, the type hints have no effect at runtime. And they don't increase performance either. Although it's theoretically possible that in the future, uh, Python may uh, use the type hints to optimize the, the compilation of bytecode. But I don't think that's very likely. It is not something that is uh, that happens in other languages that are gradu gradually typed. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about is uh, super important and uh, it's kind of a, a I'm, I'm sorry, but it's kind of a complicated issue to present if you have not seen types, types before. But even if you've never seen types before and you're interested in learning, my point here is that you should not skip the part about typing protocol. Typing protocol, I think is super important for type hints in general to work well in Python code bases, okay? So, and as an example, there was a, uh, when I was writing the chapter about type hints in my book, I found some errors in TypeShed. So what is TypeShed? TypeShed is a project in the Python organization. You can see this is a Python organization on GitHub, Python TypeShed. And TypeShed is a, is a project that has type hints for the Python standard library. Because if you open the Python standard library, there are no type hints in the Python code of the standard library. And also there are parts of the standard library that are written in C. So there's no way to put Python type hints inside C code. So the way, uh, uh, so the, when PEP484 was invented to, to introduce type hints in Python, they introduced the idea of, of a stub file, which is a, a, a Python file with an extension PYI. And that in a stub file is like a .h file in C. It's a, a file that only has function signatures and no implementation. It just has the name of the function, the names and the uh, types of the arguments and then return type, okay? Anyway, so TypeShed has annotations for almost all of the standard library and a few other important projects. Uh, and I found a, a bug there that was this bug. The, <clears throat> although the, the type hint at the time said that the statistics.medianLow function would only accept uh, numbers, uh, floats or integers, it actually works with uh, pretty with sequences of strings and other kinds of, of elements, okay? But the, 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 the signature at the time was like that. You see at the bottom there, there's a def medium low data iterable of number and it returns a number. So the problem here was what they call a type pos uh, a, 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 fa a false positive, because this type hint was too strict. It's it's it caused the tools like a type checker like MyPy or an IDE like uh, PyCharm or Visual Studio Code to flag as an error 
something that was actually not an error because you can use median to take what was median 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 low is uh, you take a, a, a list of a sequence of items you sort and you pick the middle one and if there is an even number median low takes the one to the left of the middle okay so it works with any sequence of things that you can sort doesn't need to be numbers uh, <clears throat> You know, for instance, you have a list of maybe you have a list of students and you want to split the class in two based on the name. So you can use uh, median low to find the name of the person in the middle. And then you say everybody with that name or before alphabetically, you are in, on team one, the rest is on team two. Okay. Anyway, so I, I wrote some tests and then I checked. You know uh, <clears throat> the the tests and my and 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 uh, my implementation. I did another implementation of median low to be able to test it. Actually, I think I copy and pasted. But anyway, and this shows the false positive. You see the the the, the report down down there. Median uh, uh, my pie is complaining. Okay. Uh, so this was the code with the declaration and uh, the fixed code, I had to create a protocol. So what's the idea of a protocol? Take a look at this. So on line five, I'm oh, sorry, on line two, I import protocol, okay? On line nine, I declare a new class called sortable as a subclass of protocol. And so this is the protocol definition, okay? I'm saying uh, a sortable is something that implements the method called dunder LT. Dunder, you know, double underscore, under, under, LT, under, under, we say dunder. So what this declaration is saying is that any object that implements a method called dunder lt which is the method for the less than operator which is the only operator that python needs to sort things okay to be sortable an object in python only needs to implement less than okay uh, so if there is a, a method lt dunder lt that takes another argument that may be of any type and returns a boolean and then you see the three dots there. That is syntactically valid Python. This is called that's called the ellipsis object, and it's used a lot in in uh, with uh, in stub files when you don't want to declare the body of a function. And in this case, this is not a stub file. This is a, comp a complete Python file with implementation and so on. But you use it in, in when when you declare the protocol because you don't want to specify what the method, what's the implementation of the method, right? You, so instead, you could also write pass, but the convention is to use the ellipsis, okay? So I create a, a protocol, and then I create a type variable, because why, why do I need this type variable? Because in the definition of the median, of the median low, below, in, see on line 16, I, I'm, I'm saying that median low takes an iterable of objects of a sortable type, and that's declared as a type variable because I want the return time to be the same. So this, this the, the type variable uh, connects the input type with the output type. What I'm, what I'm, what the, this code is saying is that whatever the type of the items in the iterable is that's going to be the type of the return of the return value of this function okay and on line 13 it says that this sortable t variable is bound or so it's limited by the uh, sortable protocol okay so anyway 
The syntax is not super simple. This example is a little bit complicated because it has a type variable, although it's very common when you use the, uh, protocols to need to use a type variable as well. But I, I do totally recommend that you learn to use protocols because if you don't, then adding type hints to Python will make it like a slower Java. <laughs> okay. Uh, because if you don't, if you're not using duck typing and protocols are a way of supporting duck typing with static checking, if you're not using duck typing, then you're limiting what you can do with the language, you're limiting the language itself. And in fact, a lot of functions in the Python standard library cannot be properly annotated with type hints without using protocols, okay? So after I did that, this passed, and um, anyway, in, uh, I contributed the fix. The, they, uh, the, they decided to call the, the protocol supports less than. This is a new convention of protocol supports in the name of the methods. And, there are, and when I contributed supports less than, I fixed other type hints in the type shed. And later other people came and used it to fix other things. So now there are many, uh, you know, like I can see here what seven and eight. Yeah, no, 14. Yeah, there are at least 14 uh, functions in TypeShed that use just the supports less than protocol. And there are other protocols, right? So uh, you, I, I, my, my recommendation, as I said, is to use typing protocol to build Pythonic APIs because type hint, because back typing is the essence of Python's data model and the standard library. Uh, it, it also allows you to follow the interface segregation principle, which is one of the principles in the SOLID uh, acronym of best practices, because using protocols, you don't force a client to implement methods that it doesn't need. And you should also prefer narrow protocols, which are protocols with just like one method or two methods. And rarely you, you should define protocols with more, okay? Now, we are nearing the end and I'm gonna talk about typing limits and how to address them. So the first limit of type hints is that they can, they can become very complicated when you annotate code that is very flexible the way that we like, at least the way that I like Python code. For instance, if, if this was in person, I would ask people to raise their hand. Raise your hand if you've ever had some problem with the max function. The max built-in is a par powerful function in the standard library. It has two different signatures because you can pass an iterable or several arguments. And then there are optional arguments as well. But the thing is, it's very, it's very flexible, but I never heard of anybody saying that it's hard to use or it's, you know, anyway. So the problem is to annotate this, again, somebody filed a bug and I helped fix it. In this case, it was a false negative. And the problem is I fixed this in, on TypeShed with the help of a very experienced TypeShed contributor. And the solution was all of this. Look at this code, people. This is only annotations, only type hints. There's this overload decorator because in order to support those two simple signatures here, because of the default arguments and because of the result type that depends on whether the default argument is present or absent and so on. Anyway, it took all of this code just to annotate the function. And it's weird because I wrote the max function in Python, the original one is written in C, but I wrote one to test. And the weird thing is that, and here's the full code, the top half is 29 lines of type hints, seven imports, four definitions, and six overloaded signatures just to annotate a 26 line function. 
Okay, so that's one problem with typings. They can really complicate your 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 life. Static typing is no silver bullet. You're going to, as you start using it, you're going to find false positives and false negatives. So that's when they pull complain of something is wrong, but it's actually nothing wrong, or otherwise they don't detect the errors as, that they should. Type hints don't support very simple, common, and useful data constraints. Like I, there's no way to start to write a type hint that says the quantity must be an integer greater than zero, or the airport code must be a string of three characters, or a name, the email address must not be empty, an, an empty string. There's no way to write type hints to, to make such assertions, which are really simple, right? And type hints are generally unsuitable to check business rules, okay? Really, if you want to catch errors in business rules, you need to write automated tests, you know, unit tests, integration tests, and so on. Anyway, so there's another bug that somebody filed because of something with Max, and then the the this person said this is a limitation of my pie. The tools are not perfect either. Okay. Uh, Static type checkers can't handle the expressive power of Python. They, 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 they can't support very convenient coding idioms like unpacking. When you pass like a dictionary with two, two stars and you know, you, the type checker doesn't understand that, okay? Uh, uh, it has limited support for advanced features and abstraction of the language like properties, descriptors, meta classes, and metaprogramming in general because metaprogramming is something that happens at runtime and static checkers are only looking at the code you know statically and they lag and they lag behind okay sometimes for more than a year you cannot use a new feature you know python 3.9 came out last year and Py my Py still has problems uh with type checking some features of python 3.9 right now, on the other hand, any code that you can write in Python, you can test with Python, okay? So the, I, the good sense is that, you know, if you write a lot of codes, you know, a lot of tests, you can have a program that is as robust as a C++, a Java, or a C-sharp program, like Bruce Echo said. This is a guy who has written several books about languages that are statically typed, but he learned that when he learned Python, that if you write enough unit tests, you can have very good quality code and the test will be the test will be faster to write. Okay. Compared with type hint with unit tests, type hints will help you detect a different and smaller set of bugs. Uh, static type checking complements but cannot replace automated testing. Okay. Uh, and Python is a dynamic language with powerful abstraction and, and advanced metaprogramming features. And that's why we like it. That's why I like it. And that's why a lot of people like Python, right? And the problem is that uh, if, you if you obsessively want to type check everything, uh, you're going to limit what you can do with the language, okay? Now, and here's a very important point. The teams can only avoid, there are downsides. Of course, type hints have downsides. That's what I was talking about. And you can only avoid the downsides if you, if you don't decide that type hints are mandatory everywhere, you know? Because if you say that type hints are mandatory everywhere, then people are going to be wasting time with the problems of type hints instead of just saying, okay, we're not going to annotate that. Okay, we'll just put a comment for the tool to ignore this. You know, this is the sensible thing to do about type hints. Use them, but don't be obsessive about using them all the time because if you do, you're going to be wasting time. You're going to be limiting what you can do with a very powerful language that is Python, okay? There are, uh, for instance, MyPy has options, some have options like the ones that I list on the top. 
uh, you can put in the command line or you can you know put in the CI in your uh, continuous integration tool to check but th the top ones are useful for gradual typing the bottom one are bad because if you use the bottom ones then the, you're going to have a lot of warnings that are going to uh, for uh, you know induce you to put type hints everywhere which like i said i don't think is a very good idea okay and then to to wrap up i'm going to leave this message type hints are only helpful if they're used to enhance thoughts not replace it okay and this is a variation of a phrase of by merrick who has a very famous blog post about how to misuse code coverage he's talking about testing but i adapted his thinking to type hints okay uh, it's not a good idea to to demand a certain 100 percent of type co of testing of co uh, test coverage because sometimes tests uh, you know up to 90 percent 95 percent is okay but the last few percent sometimes the, the tests become too expensive and not worthwhile and this is something that's similar in, in terms of type hints although i don't want to mention any specific numbers I recommend that every team that is using type hints agrees that type hints are not mandatory everywhere. It's okay if you don't annotate everything with type hints. So that was my talk. Muchas gracias. And uh, if we have some time, I, I left some time for us to have questions. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Luciano. Eh, excelente presentación. Está de más decir el chat, eh, todos eh, pendiente a la explicación que estuviste dando sobre type, type hints, protocols y cómo utilizarlos, cuándo y dónde. Eh, no tengo preguntas eh, ahora mismo, pero yo eh, es, quiero invitar a todo el que tenga preguntas luego. Eh, es, el lounge va a quedarse abierto, podemos entrar al lounge y a, ahí Luciano estará respondiendo cualquier, cualquier duda que ustedes tengan. Ahí están las redes de, de Luciano por igual, donde yo sé que él es muy activo en Twitter, eh, pudieran, sí, sí. pudieran conseguirlo y, y cualquier duda también vía ese canal, eh, hacérsela llegar. Eh, Luciano, nosotros como, como comunidad estamos muy agradecidos por todo el aporte que, que haces a toda la comunidad como Pai con Latán. Eh, el evento también estamos agradecidos porque estás aquí, estás aquí con nosotros, dijiste presente, eh, y eso, eso se agradece. Eh, sí, Muchas sí. gracias, Andrés. No, no, siempre gracias. Las gracias son para ti. Eh, a las personas que están ahora mismo en línea, quiero, quiero invitarlos. Se creó una sección nueva que es el cierre. Ahí estaremos haciendo el evento del cierre del, de, del evento, ya que esta, qué mejor forma de, 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 de culminar con, con una, un keynote tuyo, eh, Luciano. Entonces, eh, de aquí en adelante, a las 6 de la tarde, me acaba de informar que eh, el evento estará disponible. Eh, por favor, únanse. Eh, Luciano, si tienes tiempo también, sí. por favor, únete y sí. nos, nos vimos allá. Eh, gracias y nos vimos más tarde. Sí, muchas gracias, Andrés.